And now the next speaker is also from PTB, German. Uh, he will present the talk blockchain and e-voting. And I will present then Mr. Daniel Peters. Since 2018, he's head of the working group of embedded metrology systems at the German National Metrology Institute. I will not try to pronounce it again. PTB in Berlin. Uh, his group is doing IT security training and consulting for international metrology institutes, research on blockchain solutions based on Impelage fab, 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 Fabric, create secure virtualization environments and the software testing for measurement instruments under legal control. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mr. Daniel. Thanks for your participation in this event and go and go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Rudolfo. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope everything will work now because I had some problems. I have like many accounts, one from my university where I lecture, one for my work, my private one. So the teams went crazy. It always threw me out. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes we can. Okay, let me see if I can go full screen. And it's also full screen, yes? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, let me just start because we don't have so much time. So in Germany, the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, the PTP, is actually the uh, National German Metrology Institute. And uh, metrology, in the sense, we're also looking, looking at e-voting because uh, the law says that counting votes accurately is also some kind of uh, metrology. I don't know how it is in other countries, but this is how Germany handles it. And that's why we also do uh, research in e-voting. And if I go back, like you see my, my title here, it's blockchain and e-voting. So I want to talk about how can we construct uh, secure and private e-voting schemes on the blockchain. So I hope I'm not too much off topic. I said in Germany, actually, Metrology Institute is doing it. There will be a lot about uh, IT security and a lot about privacy. Yeah. So let me start. Electronic voting is an online process in which registered voters cast their vote from an electronic device. It can be, for example, a uh, mobile, mobile phone and transmit it via the Internet to an electronic ballot box. So the bulletin board. And in our sense, the bulletin board. Where do I have my? Slides, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I cannot see my, my window anywhere. You can see it, yeah? I see can, can what is e voting. Uh, slide. You, can, you can still see it. I don't know. I clicked yes. on the window and then all of a sudden it threw me out again. It's crazy. Uh -huh. So just give, give me a second. Let me see if I if I go next. You see the next slide? Uh, no, it's in in the same. What is e voting? What is e voting? Yeah. Windows. So I I will stop sharing and I will share again. So give me a second. I watching your uh, okay. So okay. Now, now you can see it, yeah. And uh, what is he voting? Is the same okay. slide? Okay, so mm -hmm. next, next mm -hmm. slide. Okay, okay. Now, now I just shared my screen. I'm sorry for the delay. <laughs> So go. challenges uh, in e-voting. Um, what are the challenges in such a scheme? It's uh, of course we want to have a transparent system, so the voters should, should see their ballot, but it shouldn't be transparent in the sense that another voter can see what you elected. So if you have an election system, uh, you have your uh, you give a, your vote, and it should be just visible to you. But in the in the end, when you tally together the votes, when you count them all together, the voter should be. Uh, should be sure that their vote was counted and everything was correct. So you have on the one side, you have the transparency. On the other side, it should be, of course, private. Yeah. So the vote of uh, each voter should be anonymous. The other side is also the other two is forgery proof and practically usable. So it should be easy to use, 
but in the background you should have uh, very complicated algorithms that's put it like this complex algorithms in IT security that make it uh, forgery proof. So it should be unhackable in a sense, but it's it's also uh, contrary if it's practically usable. So it should look very easy and easy understandable for, for a voter. But in the, in the same sense, in the background, there should be complex algorithms running. This is this is what we what we think about when we construct the system to make the user interface nice and easy to use but in the sense from the uh, back end we have uh, a system that runs a lot of uh, algorithms in the background that the user should trust in a way yeah okay let's get to the it mechanisms we use in our system so uh, these are like signatures if, if you know signatures in general a signature uh, is uh, something that um, if you sign it you have a public key you have a private key if you use your uh, private key to sign a message you want to send something to somebody the other end can check your message with your public key so it just uh, there's normally like a hash at the end like uh, it's uh, the whole um, data you're sending is put together in let's say 128 bits and these bits they are signed after with your private key and then if uh, a user looks at it that receives the message has your public key and then can see how the data that was sent is actually from the person i was expecting and if the signature is not correct uh, it's, it's not from that person if we talk about blind signatures we're talking about a system where somebody else actually signing the message so we have a user sending the message to to a server and in our sense if you think about voting this message is actually the ballot it's actually where uh, the voting uh, you, what you voted is uh, actually written into the message but you don't want the server to actually know what you have written in and here the scheme blind signatures signatures come into place you can let the server sign something that the server didn't see before so i, I could actually send my vote to a system the system signs the vote with their private key, with their signature, and then I get the vote back. And with this vote afterwards, I can put it in the ballot box. And when somebody afterwards looks at my vote, uh, it will see the signature. We look at the signature, see that it's from a trusted authority, like from, from the server that signed it, and then we'll count the vote. If it's not from this uh, authority, we'll not count the vote. And this is interesting for to, to avoid a double voting. Yeah. So you only want the, the voter to vote once, this is why the voter has to go to some kind of uh, authority, send the vote to it, and then get a signature. And this signature, only with that one, it, it can vote. And if it would send another uh, vote to this uh, authority, the authority would know through a list, ah, you already voted. If you know in the normal system now, if you go to the ballot box, normally there's a list, they cross your name of the list, you cannot go a second time. And this is also this kind of sense of blind signatures. I only get my signature once. And if I have my message with my signature, then I can throw it to the ballot box, I said to the um, bulletin board, uh, which can then be a, a blockchain that is uh, saving all the uh, all the uh, votes that come in that have a valid signature. So this is one scheme we actually use, so the blind signatures. Another one is a distributed ledger technology. It's more or less another word for blockchain. So if you have a blockchain like uh, my uh, um, speakers already told you it's like a ledger it's like uh, let's say a database that you write into and it has the uh, uh, ability if you write something into that database it cannot be manipulated anymore you cannot uh, erase it anymore uh, it's there for fix because the whole system is taking care of this database and if the system is correct if normally more than 50 percent of the users that take care of the blockchain uh, are uh, using the blockchain correctly, you are not able to, to change anything that you put in the ledger. And this is also good, of course, in voting, because if you have a vote, if it's in there, nobody should be able to erase it again. Then the third thing is mixed networks. Uh, in parenthesis, onion encryption. I, I have some slides to it. I, I will keep it short here. Mixed network. If you send something, uh, it's like a Tor network, like an anonymity network. If you want to send a package from A to B, you are A. You want to send it to your friend who's B, let's call him Alice and Bob. And if Alice wants to send it to Bob, Alice first goes through this mixed networks. It's, uh, it's 
encrypting their its message through the servers, let's say for three layers, if there are three servers on the way, and then the servers decrypt the message and also permutate it. So they, they mix the messages they receive. And at the end, if somebody is just looking at the network, uh, nobody will know that A sends something to B. So A sends something through Bob because it's going through the server network that is uh, decrypting message and mixing them again. And at the end, you have like scrambled uh, a scrambled network where nobody really understands which package is going to to uh, to which receiver, which uh, which sender is sending something to which receiver. This is also very interesting, uh, of course, for e-voting because you want to hide the IP address of a of a voter. So when the voter sends their vote afterwards to the ballot box to the to the let's say to the ledger then uh, if i have the ip address perhaps afterwards i can see okay this person actually voted i have its ip address i can look it look him up or look her up look at this up and then see okay she actually voted at the time and then i can can make assumptions and normally you shouldn't know if a voter actually voted and when they voted. So this is why we use the mixed networks to, to scramble the data. So it's not really known who's voting when and how and, and through what. Then the fourth thing is zero knowledge proofs. So these are all like these mathematical IT security constructs in the background is like complex algorithms that uh, are uh, that are proven to be correct. So this is normally, if you think about it in, in IT security, you still have to trust someone on the system that there are one-way functions. We are not uh, quite sure if there are these, are these NPNP problems we rely on uh, a lot. And uh, also other problems, we rely on the fact that, okay, there are one-way functions. If I have like uh, a function, I can easily compute it in one way, but I cannot compute back, like, like the, the hash fun functions like private key and public key, uh, uh, cryptography, everything is based on some mathematical construct that we, that we can generate functions that go one way but cannot go uh, back easily the other way. And if, if you have this, then you can construct these uh, IT security schemes. I'm talking here uh, right now, if you have like these one-way functions, you can generate secure functions that uh, make cryptography possible. And with zero knowledge proof, also such a scheme is you want to show something to somebody without revealing the data. In this sense, for example, when I'm voting, I want to show that I just elected for one president, so for, for one candidate. I Because if I give my ballot and then I elected for two, my ballot is not valid anymore. And for zero knowledge proof, without showing whom I elected for, whom I, whom I chose in my, uh, in my vote, I still can make sure that I just chose one candidate. So these are what zero knowledge proofs are doing. You you reveal uh, you reveal that you did something correct without revealing the secret. Uh, then the other aspect is identity-based cryptography. Here is interesting if you have a passport or you have your ID card. Identity-based means that you can uh, identify somebody by his personal data. And normally, if it's uh, implemented correctly, you don't even need a public key infrastructure anymore. So with identity-based cryptography, if you think about your ID card, if there's a chip, uh, you trust the chip manufacturer, you have like some identity data on it. Through this identity data, you can generate the public key without looking into the public key infrastructure. We didn't implement that uh, in our infrastructure, but it's interesting. I still wrote it bold. Everything that is bold is used in our infrastructure normally. We also have a public key infrastructure implemented that uh, does these things, but it's everything that I'm talking here about. It's not something we use now in Germany. It's just a research uh, project. Because in Germany, we are responsible to check these uh, voting machines, but they don't really exist yet. So what we're doing, we're just doing research. And it was also said uh, by the German government, government, they're not expecting in the next five years to actually get these voting machines. So we are on a uh, just uh, research based uh, research based grounds here. But in this in this research, we try to to look at every solution that is already available. We constructed our own network and that's why we, we don't use this identity-based cryptography through, through uh, ID cards and passports because we don't really have access to it. And another aspect, of course, is asymmetric and symmetric encryption. I already talked about it, uh, that you can encrypt data with a private key, then the other one can decrypt with a public key or the other way around. You Somebody that wants to send you data uh, encrypts it with your public key that is available for everybody. And for example, in the next point, I have it, the public key infrastructure that you can get from an infrastructure. You can ask for the public key of somebody. If you get it, you can encrypt your data with that public key and then you're sure 
only this person because only this person has the private key can decrypt the data. This is public uh, and private key um, cryptography. And you also have symmetric en encryption that you can use, for example, in the mixed network to make it faster. You use a system where you just use one key. It's, it's just faster, but the key you can still encrypt with asymmetric encryption. So somebody that receives it, decrypts it, has the has the symmetric key. Symmetric key just means the key with I with which I encrypt, I can also decrypt. Yeah. And normally, yeah, it's a, uh, it's uh, good if you have two parties that share a key, you can send it. But also, if you have parties that don't share a key, you can combine asymmetric encryption with symmetric encryption to make it faster, because symmetric encryption is normally faster. As you heard from previous uh, speakers, uh, there are like elliptic curve enc enc encryption, there are the Diffie-Hellman schemes, like with discrete logarithms, depending on how secure you want to have it. From the mathematical standpoint, they are all very secure, but like you heard, like uh, Edward Snowden said, uh, there are hooks into, into these functions that make it uh, not secure. It's not the mathematical thing that doesn't make it secure, it's how it was implemented by, for example, NSA or other uh, entities that, that put like uh, specific backdoors into the functions to then afterwards circumvent the, the encryption. Okay, public key infrastructures, I talked about it. You can get the public key from, if you have this infrastructure, uh, you can look at public keys there if it's secure. The hash functions, I also told you when, when we have signatures, hash, hash functions are one-way functions that make out of data, it doesn't matter how big it is, it makes a fixed, uh, a fixed length data, like 128 bits, 256 bits. So you put data in and you get a hash out and normally if the hash is secure, uh, depending on it, it should be it should be collision free, so it shouldn't be able to generate two messages that generate the same hash. So it should be extremely hard, of course, because uh, theoretically it's possible because the hash function is fixed, the data can be infinite, so you will have collisions uh, uh, in uh, in practical. But uh, I mean, you cannot you cannot construct them practically. So normally they are there because the uh, uh, room of the numbers uh, are not the same, but practically. 128 bit is already so big that, that you won't be able to, to guess a collision in that. And then it, you make sure that if you have a hash function, you can directly see that the data you have uh, is from, from that hash. So it's correct because the hash function generated, uh, if I have the data and the hash function, I can easily see through the hash function that everything is correct. Then uh, Mabuba, my colleague from before, she already told you about homomorphic encryption schemes which uh, make it possible to to calculate on encrypted data also interesting for e-voting so when you want to add afterwards the votes together you have many people many voters that uh, put in their ballot box if, if i don't want to reveal the data beforehand i can first uh, add everything together in the encrypted uh, in encrypted space so actually i don't have to decrypt uh, my vote i voted for a candidate a other the person waited for candidate B. Afterwards, when I add them together, I will see, okay, there was one vote for A, one vote for B. If I have a lot of people, like hundreds and two hundreds of people, I will not be able to see anymore, okay, from where did it come from? Because I didn't really decrypt the vote beforehand. I used the encrypted vote, I added together with another encrypted vote, and the result will be the same. This is what homomorphic encryption schemes can do. Also very interesting. And then at the end, when I added everything uh, together in the encrypted space, I can just decrypt it and will receive the result without looking at the individual vote. Another aspect, uh, so this is, I think, like uh, very broad, but very specific uh, introduction into the e-voting uh, community. This is everything that normally is used to, to implement e-voting schemes. The last part is multi-party computations, where you use many servers, like I explained in the mixed networks, to do a computation. And normally it's on, on, on encrypted space. So you use many people that together compute something, like the result of an election, like you have in the blockchain, you can have many nodes that compute it together. And at the end, you will just receive the result. Uh, this is multi-party computations. It is also often used. We don't use it in our scheme, but uh, it's also interesting if you are not, 
if you don't want to be sure just because at the end you will have some some individual like a central authority an entity that you have to trust to to look at the identity cards for example if you say okay i don't want to just trust one server i can split it to many servers i can say okay i have five or six servers and they work together to do something so even if one of them is fraud was hacked or doesn't work correctly i still will get the correct result if i have a correct multi-party uh, computation scheme that makes it possible for example for just free servers to run correctly if i have five servers so th these these things exist and uh, they make the overall scheme more reliable because i don't just rely on on one bottleneck on one server i can i can split it for many servers the so same same ideas that you also have with uh, blockchain technology Okay, so far a uh, lot uh, to take in uh, with the first functions. Now let's get a little bit more practical uh, how such an uh, e-voting scheme works. What are the entities that uh, want to vote? What are the um, important servers that run? So at the beginning when you vote, you have like uh, your your people like Alice, Bob and Eve. Now you say like Alice and Bob, they are the good ones. Eve is normally the the bad one, this is how we, we talk in IT security uh, denomination. So it's A, B, E, we just gave, gave, the, gave the letters names. And uh, if you see it, you first have to go to the central authority. So the central authority this is the authority that checks your passport. So when I, when I want to first vote, I, I show them my identity. Central authority says, OK, you can vote and they will give you some kind of token. So we have like uh, two kinds of tokens I, I will explain later on. But the token is like this blind signature I told you before. It's a signature of a random number I gave the central authority. And the central authority will just sign this random number only if I want, have not uh, voted before. If I ask the central authority again, if Alice would go again, in this case it's Eve because Eve is the bad one, would go again and say I want to vote again. The central authority said, no, you already came to me. I gave you one uh, blind signature. You are not allowed to, to use another one. Then with these blind signatures, so with these tokens, I can use my anonymization network. So the second part of, uh, of the structure, there, there I will send, I also have other slides, I can send my vote in, it, it gets scrambled, like mixed together and comes out at the end. At the end you have the public database, which is the blockchain, where you just put all the votes together. So in, in the normal sense, they would be encrypted till a deadline. So you leave them, then we say, okay, at six o'clock, for example, or 10 o'clock, the vote stops, the election stops. Just then you can, uh, you can decrypt all the data that is on the database, and can show to everybody transparently. They can even find their vote through their token that they send, this random number. They can say, okay, this was my vote actually, but they only only they know this, uh, their uh, random number, because I said through blind signatures, the central authority ne never saw this random number it signed. And the random number plus the vote they have, they can find it on the database and say, okay, okay, my vote was really counted. Each each person can do that if they want to, and at the end they can even see that all these votes were uh, correctly added together. Yeah. Blinded signatures. I don't want to go into too much detail because I explained it uh, at the beginning. It's like okay, I can I can send a random number to my central authority. The central authority signs that number with uh, its uh, private key, but it cannot see the message I sent to it. So the the, um, uh, the random number Alice generated in this case is not shown to the central authorities. Through mathematical constructs, I send it scrambled to it. It can generate some code that then will be the correct signature of the data I didn't see, which is helpful in our scheme because then, okay, really the central authority just gave Alice now the possibility to vote without seeing its its token that it generated. And this is one token, it's the initial voting token, we call it uh, IVT, and we have the NUT, so the network usage token, it's for denial of service attacks that uh, if if that I showed you before, that it doesn't use the network too much, the network we use afterwards, we have a, a special token that is also generated by central authority for each uh, voter, after time in a, in a time frame, it says, okay, you can only vote now for 100 times, let's say, in, uh, in I don't know, five minutes. Because why should a voter actually do, do more votes? Normally, it's just voting once. But in our scheme, it's possible, which I will also show you through a uh, um, hash chain that you can generate to to afterwards change your vote. So you can vote once, this initial voting token, but then you can have uh, on this initial voting token, because you know your random number, you can 
chain them together through a hash function. And then at the end, when you uh, decrypt the votes, you will just uh, use the last vote that is in this uh, hash chain to be counted. The others are all not valid anymore. In this sense, we can make it possible for a voter, even if they already voted, which is in the normal system not possible, they can still change their mind till the deadline is over. Because, OK, I, I can open the, the voting booth now for two weeks. Perhaps I want to vote now, uh, like like in a in a mail system where where I cast my vote by mail. I will cast it through the internet, and after one week, I will say, no, I'm not not okay with the candidate anymore. I can change it. Yeah, and this is why we have the the second token that nobody actually tries to overload the system with artificial votes. That it doesn't want to make it. It needs this network usage usage token to first have the permission to use the network. And then we can define like, okay, a user shouldn't use it more than a specific time per minute. And if this, this is the case, the network will never be overloaded. And if people use it normally, they will not change their uh, their vote every minute. It's normally okay. It's once, twice, three times. And uh, this is what the network usage token is actually doing. It's limiting your your availability to to vote a lot in a, in a specific time frame to not go into denial of service attacks yeah, to the servers. Then I talked about uh, the ballot encryption system. So it's it's the it's the mixed net, and in the mixed net you have many servers. You see it here. If you have a ballot, you encrypt it. If it goes through free service three times, and we made it here like in a green envelope, yellow envelope, and red envelope. I put it in, I encrypt it once with the server, my ballot will go through, then I in encrypt this whole thing again with the public key of the second server I want to send it, and then I encrypt it with the public uh, key of the third server. If I do, do this, if you see it, uh, I can then use my mixnet because I have here the vote, which is now in the red envelope. If we go back, you see it here was the red envelope was the last one. So the first server has the private key to decrypt the red envelope. It sends it to the second server here in the network, which has the private key to decrypt the yellow envelope. And then it goes to the last one, uh, the green one, uh, which has the has the last key, which can decrypt the last layer. And if we have a lot of votes going and we actually fix it through time slots, it's not just one, it's let's say hundreds or thousands of votes that come in. Then the server, if he receives a vote and then mutates, permutates the, the votes it receives, it receives. I don't know anymore in the second step to whom he sent the, the first vote it received in the red envelope. Because if I have many, I, I get like uh, bunches of votes. It, it cannot be even if I look at the network, I will have a lot of arrows going here, red, yellow, green. You will not be able anymore, depending how many servers you use, to actually see, OK, red went uh, at the end to, to this uh, ballot. And here I make sure yeah, also to, to hide the, the the IP address more or less of, of the user itself because uh, there are a lot of messages going through the system, not just votes. You don't know if somebody who used the system right now, the blockchain system, this mixed net server, was actually uh, casting a vote, and if they did, uh, when when it was actually received at the at the ballot box. And uh, to make sure that the servers, this is why I also talked about zero knowledge proofs before, to make sure that the server when they when they receive the vote, let's say the first one receives the red envelope, decrypts it, it should show to the network on the blockchain that it decrypted the, the envelope right. So that it didn't change the vote somehow, that when it mixed the votes together, the batches of vote that, uh, that it received, that it didn't put anything extra into it, that uh, it, it leave, left everything as it is. It should, it should just show that it mixed everything correctly and it decrypted everything correctly. And here we can use zero knowledge proofs. We don't have to show how we mixed and how we decrypted, but we can still show that we did it right. And every server, when it receives like a batch of votes, it always generates a zero proof, uh, which they can put on uh, on the on the blockchain. OK, here I talked about revoting, also short, uh, because I don't think I have so much time anymore. We use hash change, uh, hash chains to actually make sure that the voter when it has an initial vote let's say it's zero uh, and it hashes the the next random value for which it has for which it has um, a valid signature from the central authority because it's the only one that knows the random number and we said the hash function is collision free 
and nobody can guess it. So whenever I send to the blockchain my real random number here in the left sense is R1, I can show ah, I was the one that actually cast the first ballot. And then I can again send another hash, hash R2. And when I want to change my second ballot, the same thing, I can send R2 the next time. And if you look for it with the blue arrows here, if I go through such a chain with the ballots, I just say, okay, the last ballot in the R sense is ballot B will be the right ballot. On the left side, you see how, how you can do it uh, if you want infinity time of votes. Uh, on the uh, right side, you can see if you want to limit it to, let's say, B uh, vote changes. You can create a hash chain directly with HB as the end, and the um, voter always uh, sends the last one. So when the voter generates a random number, it hashes it B times, and it keeps all the hashes in between. And whenever it, uh, the voter wants to, to recast the vote, it can resend the next one in its list. And uh, as I said, because the hash is secure, uh, the voter will be the only one that, that knows this random number, so it will be the only one who can who is able to actually change the ballot. Okay, here again, uh, I, I told you all the parts. You see it in, in more general, how everything goes through from Alice, Bob, and Eve that cast the vote. It goes through the mixed service, the anonymity network, and at the end to the tailing authority, so the, to the public readable database, the blockchain. And uh, when the deadline passes, the tailing authority can then uh, just add the votes together and can show everybody by decrypting uh, the ballots that everything was transparent and correct. And the central authority here, uh, I also showed you, is the one that checks the ID card at the beginning, the passwords, and makes sure that, uh, that the voter can just vote uh, one once initially. But then afterwards, of course, with our system can change the initial vote, but cannot cast a new initial vote. Only if you have the the blind signature for one initial vote, you can then only uh, change from the initial vote the next votes, but you cannot you cannot generate a new initial vote. Every voter is just one initial vote. Okay, uh, I talked about the central authority is the one that uh, is uh, doing the blind signatures, giving out the tokens. It should be accessible all the time. This is why I also talked about this is the bottleneck here. It would be good to have many servers to have multi-party computation here, and it's needed to, to check the, the ID cards. You have the anonymity network, which is uh, the one that is also connected more or less to the blockchain. It can be a smart contract system that uh, receives encrypted envelopes, decrypts them, and goes through the mixed network and puts the zero knowledge proofs that it decrypted and mixed the votes correctly on the on the blockchain. Uh, and here you can have a system uh, with uh, with time slots that it waits for let's say 1,000 votes to come in and then it starts the uh, the, the the mixing and and uh, going forth. So for somebody that just looks at the network, they will not understand anymore because there are too many possibilities from where the vote came. You have the voting application, which should be easable to use. We didn't write it yet, so we have the just terminal. But in, when we when we get to it, should be like a nice user interface on the mobile phone, which shows you like uh, green check marks if you did something correctly, if your vote arrived. So the voter shouldn't see everything I told you now. All these complex algorithms. It should be easy to understand to use. Uh, and uh, this is also a part, this is very important actually, because it's also in German law. It, it should be, the, the voter shouldn't be stressed by the, the underlying, uh, underlying algorithms. It should be easy to use for everybody that wants to vote. Yeah, here because I said everything, I don't want to go through it again. I, I showed you in this picture actually how the overall uh, thing works. So they start from the voters they go to the central authority the central authority gives out the blind signatures this token with this token you can use the anonymity network the mixed servers then it gets mixed through at the end it will be saved in the blockchain and after the deadline has passed uh, the tailing authority can actually decrypt everything uh, Mabuba also showed you this picture nicer than mine that we have like five servers. We also did tests on, on uh, this thing, but uh, I told you from the beginning, it's it's very at the beginning. Uh, we also worked on other stuff now, but I want to come back to it because I find the topic very interesting. We can use actually also our black ch blockchain to do to do this uh, test for, for e-voting. Okay, then thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too fast because I wanted to get through as fast as possible. Please, if you have any questions uh, now or whenever you see my email address here, daniel.peters at ptp.de, please write me if you're also interested to add some servers to our network. We're very happy uh, 
to add you, we want to uh, grow our network anyways. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peters, for your presentation. And now we continue with the questions. Uh, we don't have much, um, a lot of time, uh, but at least one question. Uh, let me see if the, there is a, one question in the chat. Yes, uh, Solar SP. Yes, I have a question. Hi, your talk was pretty inter interesting. Thank you for your time. Is there a quantum computing algorithm for a voting that is already on the works or is fully implemented? So we're not looking into quantum computing resistant algorithms yet, but normally the ones that you use like AAS, they are more or less because they don't depend on, um, if you use like, let's say with elliptic cores, they don't depend on, on discrete logarithms where you can actually, um, because with quantum uh, computers, you could easily find uh, the the prime numbers when you refactor it. And these other algorithms we're using, we don't really look at it, but there are algorithms already now that are resistant to that. So they are not actually using prime refactoring to, to get secure public and private keys. But if you just rely on that, you're right. In the future, it could be a problem when uh, quantum computers get uh, more available and uh, faster and are easier to, to store to keep in the quantum state then yes, uh, we should rethink about our whole way we do business. <laughs> so if you do something on eBay, Amazon, everything, as I said, it, it depends on the thing that we have one-way functions and quantum computers uh, have a possibility to easier guess like prime factoring and, and other things. And then we have to think about new algorithms that we think are one-way functions. Yeah. But it, it's, not, it's, not our main, it's not our main research, no. Okay, we have a uh, last question. Uh, yeah, uh, you show the same uh, picture of uh, Mabubi. Is 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 possible to to after start uh, implementing a, a blockchain, you could add in new services or new uh, functionalities to it for e voting for smart meters. Yes, thank you for the question. Exactly, this is what my voice. It's the same uh, system Abuba showed, where she did her uh, uh, smart meter test. We can then use uh, the blockchain for a lot of things. It's not just one thing and you can always add servers it's a permission blockchain so you have to ask mabuba and she showed you in the picture till now ptp is like more or less the main node with with the in metro nodes and the other ones are more or less connected if we make it bigger you can give permissions to the nodes uh, what they do exactly and then of course you can everybody that is connected to the network can implement their own smart contracts and could be completely something different so parallel to the e-voting you have could have smart meters running and uh, and other algorithms that are related to metrology. But we see it now, and we I think also in the future, we'll always see it as a research network. I don't think there will be any business running on this network. It's just for people and uh, NMIs that want to come in, that want to test something before it goes into, into public, into their own country. So if they want to say, okay, we have something here, it's for research before we start developing our own blockchain and putting it out our own country, let's just test it here. Then we are the right partner for it, but uh, we were not planning to make make a business out of it. Okay, the last question: How this project changed the validation of the voting machine? The validation, in the sense, uh, if uh, what we're doing actually we're testing out what um, IT secure, uh, security mechanisms exist, and if someday, because we don't have it yet in Germany, a company comes by and says, "I implemented that way." We want to have the knowledge to know how we can validate it. And this is why we actually do it. We try to implement all of these functions I told you to have a broad knowledge about everything. Afterwards, the manufacturer themselves should decide how they implement it. So they don't need to use our, our blockchain infrastructure. They can have their own solutions. But for us, it's important because we are the validators to understand what they're doing. And this is why we are proactively doing research in this domain. Yeah. Okay. But we, didn't, we didn't validate anything. We had some voting machines in 1999. That didn't quite work. Since then, the go uh, German government said they won't, don't want to try it again. But I think in the future, of course, uh, future is coming, digitalization is coming. One day we will have it. Some country have it, like Estonia, Finland have some voting. Also, I've, I mean directly on on the on the smartphone. 
also in in the states you have for for military services smartphone you have like i think in brazil also voting machines normal voting machines so the things are there in germany we're a little bit slow because we're still afraid but we uh, we have to look into it yeah okay thanks again mr peters for your presentation and for answering the questions